So today uh, we will be talking about deep learning and transfer learning in the field of natural language processing. Uh, so Victoria asked me to talk about this today um, and I work at Accenture so we'll also uh, touch upon what am I doing, uh, what am I doing there, what are we doing as Accenture and how does a typical uh, project look like. Um, so we'll start off with an introduction about myself. Um, so as I mentioned before, I work as a data engineer at Accenture uh, within the Applied Intelligence team. Uh, currently, I'm uh, working on a project uh, within a large Dutch bank. Uh, so I'm busy with customer due diligence. That means that I am uh, yeah, building models that can predict whether a customer is likely to commit fraud um, and also anti-money laundering and all those kind of uh, like uh, financial risk, uh, risk related topics. Uh, so before I started um, as a data engineer at Accenture, I also uh, wrote my thesis internship at Accenture. Uh, and it was actually about this topic. So um, at the end, we will also um, go over it briefly. But um, yeah, today we will focus a bit more on the technology behind it. Um, so I hope, like I try to balance it a bit between the technical and non-technical parts. So I hope, um, yeah, you can all follow it. Uh, so I have a background in uh, mathematics, so bachelor in mathematics and a master in business analytics. And uh, in my studies, I focused on data science and healthcare. Uh, I actually just moved uh, last weekend from Amsterdam to Utrecht. Um, so just moved into a new place and that's really nice. Um, in my free time, I love playing volleyball, uh, kite surfing. Uh, I really love snow, so I'm actually really happy right now with the snow outside. Um, yeah, and also dinner with friends and uh, traveling if it's possible again, hopefully uh, anytime soon. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, so we start off with an introduction about uh, Accenture and then specifically uh, Accenture Applied Intelligence. Um, then we will go over the topic of today. So we will talk about natural language processing, uh, what the traditional uh, NLP pipeline looked like and how this has changed by the use of deep learning and transfer learning. Uh, then we will go over to uh, Google BERT, which is a, actually a model that uses transfer learning uh, for natural language processing. Uh, it has many applications that we will uh, discuss a bit. And then uh, at the end, uh, we will go over on how I use all these technologies uh, in uh, my thesis project, which was about biomedical relation extraction. Um, yeah, so a bit about uh, Accenture. Um, so uh, I think you might know it, but, but Accenture is a consulting company. Uh, we're quite a big company. We have uh, over half a million colleagues worldwide. Um, and there are about 3,000 colleagues uh, within the Netherlands. Uh, we have several offices. Um, I'm working at the Amsterdam office. Um, uh, but, and we're located in yeah, a lot of different countries in several cities. Um, yeah, so we're mainly working for yeah, big companies, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, so those are our customers. And yeah, there's some other uh, uh, nice things in here. 50% female leadership, uh, yeah, which is of course very good. And we also have time every year to uh, spend on yeah, volunteering during business hours. So um, yeah, for me, I am uh, giving uh, um, Python training to refugees. Uh, and I, I really enjoy this. Um, yeah, so a bit about how we're organized. So we have four lines of services, uh, Accenture Strategy and Consulting, Accenture Interactive, uh, Technology and Operations. Um, so I work within uh, Applied Intelligence and that's part of Accenture Strategy and Consulting. Um, and yeah, so we're busy with actually consulting companies on uh, on several topics and helping them to solve uh, solve possible problems they have. And then about Accenture Applied Intelligence. Um, so we have a team of about 47 uh, colleagues within the Netherlands. 
it might be a bit more or less right now, I'm not sure. Um, we are in three capabilities, data science, AI strategy, and data management. And as you can see here, we have several roles within, within our team. Um, so the data consultant uh, is really busy on uh, how to establish data foundations and also implement data management and governance. Um, and then we have a data engineer, and that's, that's me. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I will be responsible for uh, delivering kind of the back end of the AI solution. So we're not busy with testing the different AI solutions, but we're really busy with implementing, uh, creating data pipelines to really let it work smoothly. And then we have a data scientist and the data scientist is yeah, really responsible for uh, yeah, delivering valuable insights um, and also applying machine learning algorithms, statistical methods, uh, to really uh, do predictive um, uh, analysis on the data. Uh, then we have an augmented insights uh, uh, um, specialist. And the uh, augmented insights specialist is really busy in how can we visualize the data um, for the end user so that, so that the end users really understand what's happening uh, within the data. So they normally would use uh, dashboards for this but it can also be uh, an app, for instance. And then um, at the end, we also have an AI strategist. Um, and the AI strategist is responsible for really defining a vision and an AI strategy for companies. Um, yeah, so those are the five roles that are within our team. Um, and how do you actually like combine these different roles into one uh, data science project. Um, so within a data science process, there are several steps. I will uh, show them here. So um, yeah, it starts off with the ideation phase. And this is really uh, when you start at the client, what's happening? Uh, where can we help? What are the bottlenecks? Uh, it can be hosting workshop where you define a problem. Um, and then after that, you have the understanding phase. Um, in this phase, you're really busy with what are the business challenges, getting the data that's needed, um, and also what's the quality of the data. So really understand what is the problem, where can we uh, help. And then the third step, third phase is the building phase. And within the building phase, uh, we will be preparing, preparing the data so that's ready for some kind of model. And then we're also actually building several models. And in this phase, it's all about testing different models. So really try out, oh, how does this work? How does this work? And then um, within the deployment phase, we're actually going to test, test the model that came out of the building phase. Um, so in the deployment phase, we're making sure that the model is ready for yeah to get into the field and really optimize this um, and then after like the model is ready we go into the implementations so within the implementation phase um, uh, you make sure it's available for the whole organization uh, it's also about yeah having a bit of documentation of course i'm not sure <laughs> if you like it i am not a big fan of it but it's really important of course um, and then the last step is the maintenance phase. So after you created something, you really have to make sure that it will yeah, keep on working. Um, yeah, so it's also quite an important step. Um, but as a data scientist, you're not, of course, uh, present in all of the steps. So in the three steps here in the middle, this is where the data scientist has the, and the data engineer has the most uh, value. Um, so in the understanding phase, uh, the building phase, and the deployment phase. And I visualized it here a bit better. Uh, and you see the different roles and how they are, how important they are in the specific phases of the data science process. So as you can see here, the data strategist, it's really, uh, uh, yeah, really important in the understanding phase, uh, not really in the building phase, but again, it's a bit important in the deployment phase because it has to transform the testing results into some uh, conclusions, of course. 
Uh, then the data scientist. Uh, the data scientist is available in all the different phases, um, but uh, is mainly focusing on the building phase. So really testing different models, see what model fits this problem best. And the data engineer is focusing on the building phase and the deployment phase. And then mainly focuses on how can we uh, get this model to work on a bigger scale. Okay, so that was a bit about how do we work with an Accenture. Um, and also, I hope you understand a bit better how the different roles um, uh, have different functions within a project and how they're also working together. So now we're gonna go over to the, yeah, the really uh, geeky stuff. Um, so I will give you a brief introduction of natural language processing, but before that, I created a slide O because I'm really curious what you already know. Okay, this is good. I see most people, 60% uh, has heard of it. Also some people that's the first time they hear about it. And also, and even some people that have experience with it. I see many people joining. Oh, 63, and I see 90 people in the call. Okay, that's good to hear. So most people uh, have some experience. So um, yeah, I hope that it's uh, not too technical for the people that don't have any experience. Uh, but if you're interested in the topic, I really advise you to just uh, maybe read about it afterwards. Uh, so what is natural language processing? So natural language processing, um, it's actually a branch of artificial intelligence and it helps computers understand, interpret, and manipulate human language. Um, so it's actually about really letting the computer learn how to read text. Um, so before I will give um, many examples, I will first uh, ask you if you can, uh, can maybe give any examples. I see uh, many good answers coming in, so translation, uh, sentiment analysis. Siri is a really big one, I see. It uh, has definitely a lot, of, a lot to do with, uh, with natural language processing. Spelling check, it's also uh, a really good one. I'm not sure if you noticed it, but Google Translate is actually uh, much better in the last, uh, last few years, like a couple of years ago after, always when I... I uh, typed in something I thought, what is it for kind of translation? Uh, but now it's actually, it's actually really good. And that's also because of the topic we're going over today. Speech to text, Alexa. Okay, yeah, I see already uh, many, uh, many examples coming in. Uh, so that's good. Um, let's just wait for a couple more seconds. Search engines, yeah, really good. Okay, um, and then I created um, I created the, like the question tab here. So if you have any questions, you can type them in here and then uh, I will go back here at the end and see what kind of questions uh, were asked. And you can also upvote a question from someone else if you have the same question. Okay. Uh, mm, <clears throat> yeah, so we'll mm, go over some examples here. Um, so we discussed some in the earlier, but I think one uh, really famous NLP problem is sentiment analysis. And this means um, defining the, whether a text is positive or negative. And this can really help if you, for instance, want to check uh, whether a movie review is a positive or a negative movie review. I might uh, go back to this example uh, later in the presentation. 
Um, and then also machine translation. Uh, so if you want to go from a text in one language into a text in another language, it's not only about translating the words, it's really about understanding the sentence and translating that specific sentence to another language. Uh, there are some other uh, examples here as well. So uh, question answering. So uh, give a document to the computer and we ask a question about that document. And then the, the computer learns how to find um, the part where the, where the answer is uh, located. Uh, it can also be used to summarize a text um, or um, yeah, um, try to find spam in your email inbox. Um, yeah, so that a bit about the applications of natural language processing. Um, I will go over to how how is a um, yeah traditional NLP pipeline. How, uh, what are what is included in there? So um, uh, NLP changed a lot about, over the past few years, and um, I think about five years ago uh, this pipeline was used uh, almost all the time, and it's still used in many, uh, many problems. Uh, so how it, how it goes, you go from some kind of document or text or, or sentence, um, and then um, you really define, uh, define your features. So you look at, but how can I, uh, how can I visualize my text uh, so that some kind of model can understand it? And, um, you have several pre-processing steps here, so uh, you might need to uh, remove some stop words or um, do some grammatical labeling of your data. And what you're actually doing here is you're kind of uh, extracting all the knowledge that you know um, about the language, and that might uh, help the computer to understand the language. So if I want to translate something, I might be busy with uh, what's the grammar form of this word or what's the um, like the simplified form stemming means that you kind of go back to one uh, simplified form, form of the word. Um, so you kind of want to know all of the information that you think might be useful and you put that in some kind of model. Um, and of course, all these rules, they are different for different type of languages. So you uh, will do something different if you want to uh, do the task in English uh, or in Dutch, for instance. Then in the second step, um, you try to uh, visualize uh, the, the text in order uh, for the computer to understand this. Um, so this could be, if you have a text, uh, count, to count how often a, a specific word occurs in the text. Um, and this might say something about uh, if you want to have the sentiment, for instance, and the word good is uh, occurring a lot of times in the text, uh, this is a good indicator that it's a good review. But it can also be that, the, that it was uh, not good in the text and it will still count the word good. Uh, so a lot of problems are actually occurring here, but um, yeah, this pipeline works actually quite well, but it's a lot of work. So you have to know uh, a lot about every specific step of the, of the whole pipeline. Um, so at the end, you do some kind of, you apply some kind of model, and then you can have your output, which could be the sentiment, but it can also be uh, some other task you want to, uh, you want to complete. So this was actually how uh, yeah, the main the main pipeline for natural language processing, but there's a change happening. So uh, from this traditional pipeline, we're more and more shifting towards uh, deep learning in natural language processing. So what's actually the difference? Um, so on top of here, we have the traditional NLP pipeline, and then below we have a deep, deep neural network. Um, so the difference is here that we, instead of doing all these pre-processing steps and the modeling steps, uh, we transform our, our kind of text into some kind of raw input, in this case, embeddings, and those will go into some, some deep neural network. And uh, the deep neural network is really known for, um, it will find patterns 
um, pattern, patterns in the data itself. So you don't have to specify uh, the grammar of the sentence, but hopefully the deep neural network will find uh, this patterns itself. Uh, and then uh, actually the deep neural network will um, uh, calculate the same outputs as the uh, machine learning model would do. Okay, so I mentioned here the uh, embeddings. So we're transforming uh, raw input into embeddings. But what is this? So uh, I can visualize it here a bit. So if we have certain words uh, in a sentence, we are um, transforming the specific word into some kind of factor. And um, this means that uh, words with similar meaning will occur uh, close to each other in, within the factor space. So king will be closer to man uh, than, uh, or king will be even close to man as queen to woman. And also the other way around. So king and queen and man and woman. Uh, but as you can imagine, some word which has nothing to do with this might be uh, much farther away from uh, these words. Um, so instead of doing like all of the pre-transformations, you're actually um, just transforming your words in a vector. And a vector is something that computers can understand because they are just built with uh, numbers. Okay. And in a previous slide, I showed after we have the embeddings, it will go to, into some kind of deep neural network. And this is really where the complex uh, stuff happens because it's like, it looks quite simple here, but it can be quite, uh, quite difficult. So here are some, <laughs> some examples of some like deep learning architectures that are used a lot. So we have a recurrent neural network and the recurrent neural network, it reads from left to right. So if we have a sentence, this movie is bad and we want to specify the sentiment, it will go over the sentence, and at the end, it will specify whether it was a positive or a negative review in this case. But it can also be that the task would be uh, we want to translate the sentence, and then we are translating the word based on the word and also everything that was in front of it. And then on the right-hand side, um, it's a bidirectional long short-term memory because uh, what's happening is that these models are not really good at, um, so they are going from one side to another. So the the other one is bidirectional, so it can also reach from right to left. Um, and yeah, the the this was kind of introduced, I think, uh, about four or five years ago, um, and it has some improvement in the field of natural language processing, but not a lot because there was are actually two uh, major problems with this. And uh, those were that in deep learning, you need a lot, a lot of data, a lot of data in order to um, let it work properly. Um, so before we actually achieved a higher performance than the other uh, NLP pipeline, we had to train it for a very long time and uh, with a lot of data. And then the other problem is that um, so we're talking about recurrent neural networks. Um, they have internal dependencies. So within the network, there are dependencies between the nodes. And this means that you cannot train it on a parallel system. So um, I think you all learn a bit about clouds, cloud computing maybe. Uh, so what's happening is that if you want to speed up your, um, your kind of computing power, you can distribute it over several uh, servers or several systems. And with recurrent neural networks, this was not possible. Um, so this was actually a major, major downside for um, recurrent neural networks. So then what they did, they uh, decided, okay, we're gonna go look into another direction and we're gonna look at uh, encoder decoder architectures. Um, so I'll really simplify it a bit here. So <laughs> what's happening, you have some kind of input text and it will go into some kind of en uh, encoder. 
And this will go, uh, the encoder will transform it into some kind of vector. And then we have the decoder and that decoder transforms the vector then again into some kind of output test. And uh, this architecture was already used a lot in uh, uh, machine translation. Um, I will show you later a bit uh, why. Uh, and it's currently also uh, yeah, kind of the core of the uh, improvements in natural language processing. So what's happening um, in this encoder-decoder uh, architecture? So we have some kind of sentence, I love you, for instance, and we want to translate it into the, to the Dutch sentence, ik hou van jou. Um, so instead of really go over the sentence like the recurrent neural network did, uh, the anchor the um, decoder architecture is looking at all of the words at the same time and see for every word uh, in the um, in the in the translation what are the words that are important for this uh, for this specific word. So to visualize this a bit, if we want to translate the word ik, uh, the word that was most important was the word I, and for how this was uh, both I and love. And so we can uh, go over the words and see what were the words that uh, were most important for this uh, specific uh, translation. And what's really good about this uh, is that it's quite easy to um, visualize this. So what you can do, I showed here an image of like the a French sentence and then uh, the translation. And you see really what are uh, what words were important when the machine learned this uh, to translate this sentence. And on the right hand side, you also see this for a sentiment of a of a food review. Uh, so if we read the sentence, you definitely can say uh, it's a negative review. But what were the words that really caused this review to be negative? So the machine learned that this was tasteless and too sweet. Uh, and the same for the right hand side, for the image on the right, where it's a positive review. Uh, but I can imagine that it's uh, all quite hard to imagine how the computer goes from the architecture into uh, learning these kind of stuff. So how can the, can the machine actually do this? Um, so it's uh, transfer learning is used here um, because one big thing about natural language processing is we don't want to label the data ourselves. We don't want to specify for every review whether it's positive or negative because the whole thing about machines uh, to understand language is the, that we don't have to read everything anymore. So uh, we want to actually train a model without labeling the data ourselves. Um, so we do this by uh, creating an unsupervised, unsupervised language task. So what we do, we are just um, using the data that we have and we are removing some parts of it. So one, one um, task could be uh, remove the last word of a sentence and then let the machine learn what, is, what was the last word of this sentence. So, for instance, I, I thought I would arrive in time, but ended up five minutes, and then the computer tries to learn how to fill this gap. And the next one is kind of similar, but then we randomly mask some words uh, in the sentence. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the last one, it's also used sometimes where you give the computer two sentences, and the computer should uh, specify whether the, the second sentence was uh, following on the first uh, sentence. And by doing this, uh, the model is really um, is learning how to understand the context of the language because it's, it doesn't really, it, it's not yet learning a specific task, it's really focusing on how to understand the language. So how can we then uh, apply this uh, to a problem that we have ourselves? So for instance, if we want to 
um, predict uh, movie reviews, as a, an example that I mentioned before. Uh, the first step would then be um, we uh, take a model and we train it on a lot of data, text data. So, for instance, uh, Wikipedia. So, we're just give all the data, all Wikipedia text data to the model, and we do one of the unsupervised learning tasks that we mentioned uh, earlier. After this step, the model is really able to uh, understand uh, what is the language about and how can I how can I read it. Then, in the second step, um, we uh, want the want the model to understand movie reviews. So we do again the unsupervised learning task, but then on the text data that our problem is about, so about movie reviews. Uh, and we do not yet specify whether the movie review was positive or negative because we don't want to label all of the data. Uh, so we only give them the model all of the movie reviews. And after this step, the model is able to understand movie reviews. And then in the third step, uh, we just give the model some uh, labeled data. So we let's say we label 100 movie reviews and say whether it's positive or negative. And it, the model already knows how to read the language. It only needs to learn how, to, how can I uh, specify whether this movie review is positive or negative. So, uh, yeah, and then you give it some examples. And from these examples, it can, uh, yeah, it can learn how to, uh, how to do things. And this, uh, this changed a lot because in previous um, research, um, the model had to learn from only movie reviews and then learn how to specify this. Um, so this was actually the idea behind uh, Google BERT. Uh, so I mentioned it a bit in the beginner, but beginning, but Google BERT is yeah, kind of a popular uh, language uh, representation model. Um, so I mentioned the three steps and BERT is actually a model that's already did the first step for you. So it's trained, uh, it's a really big model about a uh, hundred of millions of parameters and it's trained for about 10 days. So it already knows how to understand uh, data. And then you can actually use BERT for your own problem um, because it's, yeah, you're actually using someone that is already able to understand language. So you only have to train it on your own uh, task. Um, yeah, so this was a big, uh, I think, improvement in the field of natural language processing. So yeah, this is some uh, uh, NLP benchmark. Uh, are some like uh, on the horizontal axis, we have uh, several tasks that are kind of uh, yeah, benchmarking, like they always, if they have a new model, they try it on all the different tasks. And uh, yeah, BERT was like in, improves all the scores on every task. Um, yeah, so all uh, I think really cool, but how can we actually apply this? Um, so I applied it um, to extract uh, biomedical relations from uh, biomedical literature. So why would you actually do this? Um, so the problem was actually defined as there is like uh, within the biomedical domain uh, a lot of literature, um, new literature coming coming in every day, and it's really hard to uh, keep up with uh, keep up with the research. So it's all, all about um, uh, drugs that can cure diseases or uh, diseases that cause symptoms, and it's quite hard to really um, yeah, keep up to date with all these changes uh, happening. Uh, and what was happening is that experts had to read the text themselves and then say what um, new findings were uh, in, this, in this literature. Um, so this was the problem. And in order to come up with the solution, uh, there were some steps. Um, so in order to get some some labeled data to test the models. Uh, we looked for um, kind of uh, existing uh, databases that consisted of uh, biomedical relations. And a relation, as a relation, you can see, for instance, a drug that is uh, causing a disease. So that would mean a drug having a side effect. 
uh, or also uh, this uh, drug that is uh, curing a disease. And then we look online for sentences that describe this relation. And uh, we, do, we uh, uh, did several models, so deep neural networks, uh, the models that I just um, touched upon earlier with the bidirectional LSTM model, and then also BERT as well as BioBERT. And then BioBERT, it's uh, BERT, but then also trained on biomedical uh, data. So it already knows a bit more about how can I read uh, biomedical data, uh, biomedical literature. Um, yeah, so um, we had a knowledge graph of about uh, four different uh, relations. So a drug causing a disease, a drug treating a disease, a disease that presented some kind of uh, symptom, uh, and also two drugs if you take them at the same time, um, you have some, uh, it, you can get sick, for instance. That means two drugs uh, that interact. Um, and then we find, yeah, some uh, sentences, they can, of course, be quite difficult. So we reported a case of bullistic systematic lupus. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a word to, okay, I think you can, uh, <laughs> can read it yourself. Uh, and then we label it with some kind of label. So in this case, uh, oral dapsone uh, treats uh, the disease. Uh, but it, this one is, I think, still uh, quite easy to understand, but it can be that the sentence, like, I myself have no clue what's going on, and that, like, uh, experts need to read it in order to really say uh, what's, what's happening in the sentence. So I applied a uh, bird for this, and I will not go over the details too, uh, much, but I got about 20% performance increase after uh, using BERT, BERT. And this is yeah really big if you're uh, talking in uh, performance uh, uh, within data science models. Uh, yeah, so that a bit about how I applied this. I can imagine that you want to apply it yourself as well. Um, so it's an open source um, library and uh, there are several pretend models um, and there is a notebook uh, on Colab, Google Colab. I'm not sure if you know about this, but it's uh, uh, kind of, um, yeah, you can go over the steps yourself and it will help you um, build a movie view view sentiment analysis uh, with uh, BERT. Um, yeah, so that was about uh, the trends for learning uh, in natural language processing. I hope uh, you all understood it, but uh, yeah, let's, I will uh, uh, go over into the questions and see whether there are some questions in there. Okay, I see uh, nine questions. If you have any other questions, you can also ask them in the chat. Yes, and I think uh, uh, thank you so much, Ines, for for the beautiful presentation and explanation. Uh, honestly, even myself, without prior knowledge of NLPs, I could follow it. I could follow it, and now I understand how you encode and decode, and how you know the the back end of this you know system would work like. Um, Let's open the, the floor for Q and A's. I would like to mention that there is no such thing as a stupid question. So whatever comes to your mind, please put it in there and uh, Ines will try to uh, address them as many as possible. We have 15 minutes. So I think Ines, that's plenty of time. I would yes. like to that we indeed use Slido for it. So I will uh, keep an eye on the uh, chat as well, but it seems that our students are using the slido.com. So yeah, lead the way. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. And just, you can also ask questions about like the technical part, but also about uh, our work at Accenture. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, let's see, uh, there are already some interesting questions. Uh, so let's go over the first one. How? How does this deep learning model handle? Uh, handle ambiguity, for example, all the different meanings set has and garden pot sentences as the old man on the boat. 
Um, so this specific model does not look at um, the uh, one one word itself, but it really looks at the whole context of the word. Uh, so it also looks at the uh, not only the word, but also the words around it. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I, uh, I assume it is. Um, how long does it take to train an NLP model? Um, it really uh, depends on what kind of uh, data you're using and how much data you're using. And also if you want to uh, train a model from scratch. Uh, so the Google Bird model, it took 10 days to train, but uh, my models usually take about a couple hours or maybe in uh, really extreme cases, it can take one night. But it's, uh, normally it's not, not too long. Uh, what programming language is normally used for NLP models? Um, I'm always using uh, Python, uh, but and I think that's that's the most used one. But I think uh, either Java or R or C C plus plus are also possible. Um, it depends what what you like. But um, in Python, there are many like predefined libraries that you can use uh, in order to make your life much easier. How does reinforcement learning improve NLP training? I'm actually not sure about this. Um, so I don't know of any research uh, with reinforcement learning within natural language processing. Um, yeah, it might be interesting to look into, but I don't, I don't know the answer to this question. But I know that's not really common to use uh, reinforcement learning. Mm. Does fingerprint recognition considered as as uh, NLP? Um, no, fingerprint recognition is not uh, an NLP problem because there's no. Uh, no text involved here. And um, I think this is a really good question during the pre-training phase. How do you minimize the impact of potential biases may be present in the data set? Um, deep learning models are definitely not uh, good at detecting uh, bias. And I think this is also uh, downside of most deep learning, but also machine learning models, that their um, yeah bias uh, is uh, quite a dangerous thing here. Um, and there is not uh, yet a really good solution uh, for this. Um, yeah, so bias can always be available in your model. If you have any more questions about the answers I give, you can always uh, always ask them, of course. Uh, what hardware is needed? Um, so for Bert and many other um, problems, you need to have a GPU. Um, but I trained it on Google Colab because they have free uh, GPU available. And this, this question is every word have a factor for each of its synonyms. Um, so within word embeddings, this is the case that, um, yeah, if a word has uh, several meanings, uh, oh no, this, it's about uh, synonyms. So synonyms would uh, have a different factor, but uh, they, the, like, the vectors are quite close to each other. But if a word has multiple meanings, this would mean that it's has, having the same vector. Um, but within um, the more um, the model that Google uses, um, the vector is not based on a single word, but also on the surroundings of the word. Is there a role of an actuary? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure about this one about the actuary in Accenture. We have an interesting question from uh, Jay in the comment. Yeah. 
So, Ines, you said that you currently uh, you currently work at recognizing potential fraudulent clients at major banks. Not everyone at the banks will be happy with that. Any pushback? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but banks are actually, uh, they have to check all of their customers on fraud. Um, so if they're not doing uh, this, they can be sued for this. Uh, so this happened, happened sometime, I think. And also uh, at ING, I know that some, uh, some uh, like uh, high employees, they got, uh, they got sued because they were not checking all the customers on fraud. So It's actually a really big, big thing right now that the bank is busy with uh, checking their customers on fraud. And like they used to do this just that someone had to go over the customers. But imagine a bank having 10 million customers. Uh, it can take quite some time to check all of the customers. So we're yeah, kind of building models so that it will get fa go faster. And we only have to look at the customers that the model thinks are, are risky. Yeah, this one is new. Does the model allow for an assessment of correctness given that many texts written by people may be confusing or wrong and lower the output quality? Um, I, I actually don't think so. Um, but the current models, they, like they're, uh, they're actually really correct. There's also this new model that's It's kind of a bit like deep fakes that can uh, write text themselves and it writes news articles. And then um, uh, yeah, like people had to say whether the news article was written by the model or what it, whether it really uh, was a real news article. And most people couldn't, could not tell the difference. Uh, so this is how good the models are, are right now. Could you share the link to the movie if you collab? I can. I see that it's. Let's send both of the links in the chat. Um, and then here I see another question. Does Accenture build AI uh, algorithms in house? If yes, what are those? Um, so we don't actually build uh, the AI models ourselves. We're mainly um, because we're also more on the client side. Uh, so it can. I think it can be that uh, the Accenture technology built some AI models uh, from scratch, but uh, we're more on the side where we really implement the models at the client. Um, so we go to a client and see what is the uh, problem here. And then uh, um, it's, it's not uh, happening a lot of times that the problem would be like a completely new AI algorithm. It's more that it's a existing one that we will implement, uh, implement there. Oh yeah, I see here an interesting question. Is there anything special happening in the convergence point you mentioned in the first slides? Um, so what I mean with the convergence points, I uh, did not mention it in the presentation, but it means that after a certain phase, uh, you converge and end it Uh, before you go to the next phase. And this is quite important because you're, if you're in the deployment phase, you don't want to get back to the understanding phase because apparently you did something wrong there. Um, and this is also uh, dangerous because if you go back to the understanding phase, you also have to go over uh, the building phase uh, another time. So you really want to make sure uh, that you end your phase um, at the end uh, before you start the new phase. Um, which course do you recommend on NLP for someone who has experience with linear algebra, algebra statistics and calculus? Um, yeah, I know there are some really good courses online, um, but I have to actually look up the name. Um, maybe I can um, um, send it to you afterwards, Victoria, that you can maybe uh, share it with the students. Sounds like a plan. Can cool. you take the last question from the, if there is any more? Uh, and we can now uh, already round it up. Yes, uh, I think this is the last question. Does the neural net, neural language need a supercomputer to process, process, process it? Uh, it definitely does not need a supercomputer. You can, uh, it's yeah, advisable to have a GPU on your computer or do it in uh, Google Colab, but uh, no, you certainly don't need a supercomputer.
But it might be that the models itself are uh, trained on the supercomputer, though. But I'm, I'm not sure about that. Thanks a bunch, Ines. I actually myself have a bit, uh, have have one question. Um, I come from the business perspective, right? So I'm very interested in the applications of the NLPs, and I was wondering what is the most um, futuristic, uh, impressive mm -hmm. application that you, in your professional opinion, would expect it to come up in the upcoming 20, uh, 20 years. Of course, you know the application is using the NLP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna uh, uh, use it for like brains connecting to computer. Or <laughs> what's it gonna be? Oh, I'm not. I'm not sure about that, but um, <laughs> but I think it's quite cool that it, like it can, for instance, uh, record uh, conversations and then automatically uh, give a summary of where the meeting was about, for instance. Um, uh, yeah, or a presentation and automatically generate some text that uh, summarize this, but it can also be, um, yeah, I want to write a, write a story and then you say to the model, I want a story about this. And then the model can, can do really it. do it himself. Yeah. Oh, wow. That would be easy, guys, right? Imagine you tell them, like, my assignment is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and calls the assignment. <laughs> 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 Thanks a bunch, Ines, for, for the knowledge that you've shared. Guys, this session will be available on YouTube. I will uh, share with you the, uh, the link so you can go uh, back towards it and uh, listen again you know, to the uh, presentation. Um, as a thank you uh, towards Ines, I would like if everybody could uh, unmute themselves. And we're going to do a round of applause for Ines so that everybody can hear it. Can everybody unmute themselves? Let's see each other. Come on. Everybody. There it is. <laughs>